Summary of a People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn. Zinn wants to write a people's history of the United States from the point of view of people who have been mistreated, weakened, and left out, rather than the normal heroes and leaders. First, he talks about Christopher Columbus's discovery of the New World in 1492. Over the next hundred years, European explorers killed off whole Native American groups and brought back a lot of money for their home countries. Early in the 1600s, English settlers came to North America. Soon after, they started a series of wars with the Native American groups, in which they used terror methods to show that they were in charge. Slavery was also a big part of life in the early North American colonies. Settlers from England took African slaves and forced them to work for free. They also hired poor white people as indentured workers and made them work for free while they paid off their debts. A lot of the time, slaves rose up against their white masters. In fact, many wealthy people in early colonial America were afraid that black slaves would join forces with poor whites and take over the colonies. Elites made rules that were meant to keep poor whites, Native Americans, and black slaves away from each other so that they would check upon each other. At the end of the 18th century, the Founding Fathers planned a movement against the British. But these people weren't really radical in how they saw the future. Instead, they were rich and powerful people who saw a way to get even stronger by using the working class against Britain, an outside enemy. During the Revolutionary War, American leaders came up with the idea of freedom and equality as a way to control their people. This idea is still used by leaders today. The Founding Fathers wrote the Constitution in the 1780s. It set up a strong central government so that the Founders could protect their own property and interests. In the 18th and 19th centuries, American women from all classes and backgrounds stood up for their radicalism over and over again, even though their society was very sexist. When women were able to go to college more often in the early 1800s, educated women got more involved in feminist issues. In the early 1800s, the United States became a major imperialist power. It did this by first forcing Native Americans off their native lands, which was against deals that the U.S. government had signed, and then by taking over Mexican land in the Southwest. The Mexican-American War in the 1840s was a model for American aggression. The U.S. government would always find a weak reason to start a war and then use that reason to get more land and resources. People often remember the Civil War as the event that made the federal government step in and end slavery for good. There were, however, generations of conservative Americans who led riots, slave revolts, and used their right to petition the government, which is why the federal government finally gave in. When the slaves were finally freed, the government didn't do much to help African Americans. During the years after the Civil War, which were called Reconstruction, the federal government did help African Americans in the South by giving them money and troops. The federal government stopped helping African Americans after 1876, though, and started backing the interests of wealthy Southern businesspeople instead. The federal government became more open to working with businesses in the second half of the 1800s. In fact, it backed military actions, especially in Latin America, that were meant to make American businesses stronger. Still, a lot of people were against America's belligerent and domineering foreign policy. There was also a lot of work and union action in the 19th century. Workers in the U.S. went on strike, protested in the streets, and asked for better pay and shorter hours because the law and the government didn't even try to protect them. So, the federal government repeatedly showed its support for business by sending troops to break up strikes and keep things running as normal. If the government did help the average worker, it was careful to make small, surface changes to the system. These changes were meant to make the people of the United States happy without really helping them. Because the government didn't care about the workers, they turned to anarchism, socialism, and communism, which were ideas that disagreed with the capitalism idea that private companies should run production and industry. The United States sent its poorest people to fight in World War I, even though the war had nothing to do with them. It also made a bunch of rules that made it illegal for people to speak out against the war in any way. 
During that time, many socialist leaders were jailed for saying what everyone already knew, World War I was an unfair, imperialist war. The federal government kept up its policies of moderation and peace during the Great Depression. It passed some laws that helped workers, but it didn't do anything to truly question capitalism or the American business elite. The United States said it was fighting World War II for moral reasons only, to end fascism in Europe. Zinn says the government actually fought in World War II because it thought it would be a good chance to make the United States the most powerful country in the world. When the war was over, the United States had built relationships with world leaders that made it possible for its companies to trade freely with other countries. When the United States dropped two atomic bombs on Japan, they stopped the war and killed a huge number of people. This was mostly done to show that America was now the world's most powerful country. The US and the USSR were at odds with each other during the Cold War. The US government tried to scare the American people by threatening a communist takeover of the world. As a way to protect democracy and fight communism, the government always said it was funding coups and right-wing dictatorships around the world, which often got rid of freely elected socialist leaders. The establishment really wanted to protect its own business interests by making sure that world leaders would keep working with American companies. America was filled with extreme anger that had been building up since the 1960s. The people pushed for hundreds of radical populist causes, such as gay rights, women's rights, civil rights, protecting the environment, paying Native Americans what they were owed, and more. The government's reaction to the actions of its people was often to make weak, surface-level changes that didn't get to the bottom of the problems. For example, the government changed the way people vote to protect the voting rights of African Americans, but it did nothing to stop the poverty and racism that many black people had to deal with every day. American extremism seemed to die down in the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s. But this was mostly because the news stopped covering protests by the people. In the meantime, the American government, which went back and forth between Republican and Democratic leaders, stuck to a pretty steady political plan to cut back on welfare and raise the military budget. The U.S. defense budget kept going up even after the Cold War ended. A record number of Americans protested the 1999 meeting of the World Trade Organization in Seattle. This showed that anarchism was still alive and well in the United States. Zinn talks about the war on terror in the last part of the book. During this time, the government sent troops to the Middle East to fight Muslim attackers. In the end, Zinn says that the American people need to decide if they support morals and decency or empire and military violence. It's too early to tell how the US will respond to the war on terror. About the author. Harry Howard Zinn was born in Brooklyn. Growing up, he learned by reading all of Charles Dickens's books and hanging out with communists in his neighborhood. Zinn was 18 years old when he went to a calm protest in Times Square and was knocked out by a police officer. The event changed the way he thought for a long time. Zinn served in the Air Force during World War II and then went on to get an MA and PhD in history from Columbia University. After moving to Boston University in 1964 to teach history, he quickly became a well-liked member of the staff. He took part in the civil rights movement and protests against Vietnam. His most famous book, A People's History of the United States, came out in 1980 and has been a huge hit ever since. He was one of the most respected and liked people on the American left. He died at the age of 87. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.